today I'm preaching a sermon that I've got to be honest with you, I'm not fully comfortable with. And let me explain why. I find myself most comfortable preaching verse by verse, line by line, word by word. It's something I find, it suits me down to a T. I like it, I like the structure, I like the safety. And every time I've tried to preach topical sermons in this church, there's always been something that just hasn't gone quite right. I'm just not a big fan of topical sermons. I like expositional, systematic teaching. But today, um, led, I hope, by the Holy Spirit, I have been forced to <laughs> te- uh, preach a more topical sermon. Today we're going to be looking at an overview of all seven churches. And what we're going to be looking at is what I believe is a secondary purpose of the churches. As you may know, in the books that we've studied before, if I take, for example, the book of Ruth, in the book of Ruth, you had a real story happening. There was real people living real lives, going through something. But behind the story in the book of Ruth, there was a prophetic message being spoken to the world. A similar thing happens with Abraham when he's taking his son Isaac up the mountain. He lays the wood on Isaac and he takes him up with the fire and the knife. There's a real life situation happening, but it's prophetic of Jesus Christ and the cross thousands of years later. And this is all the way through the Bible. The Bible is so incredible that it can have like 10 layers to it. 10 different reasons that the Lord inspired those words. And it is my belief and the belief of Ben Kente and the belief of many commentators and pastors before me, and I'm pleased to say that I'm not the first person doing this, that believes that the behind the seven churches, there is a secondary and prophetic reason for their writing. Many people believe, myself included, that the seven churches represent prophecy. That within the seven churches... All of the church age is summed up. From the moment the church was born to the moment it's taken out of this world can be found within the seven churches. So I'm going to just take a little bit of a preamble before we pray and start. I want to make something absolutely abundantly clear. This is a secondary application. This does not contradict anything you have heard over the last seven weeks. And if I had to choose between preaching this message and preaching the last seven weeks' messages, I would always choose those ones. Because they had direct application to your lives, and that was the primary reason that Jesus was writing to the churches. They were real churches going through real issues that Jesus was really addressing. So I want to make that absolutely clear. However, there's a reason that Jesus chose those seven churches. For example, the church of Colossians, Colossae, was smack bang in the middle of those seven churches. Literally smack bang in the region, the church of Colossians. And yet Jesus doesn't choose to address them. And there is a reason. So the main purpose of the letters to the seven churches is to our individual lives and our communal lives as a church. But there is a, what I believe is a secondary reason that we're going to get into today. Now, what you're going to need to do today is weigh and test what I'm saying. You are either, at the end of this sermon, going to completely agree with me, completely disagree with me, or be very confused. I'm seriously hoping that you either disagree with me or agree with me. I would much rather that than anyone be seriously confused. So I'm praying that God is going to keep us from that. But you need to weigh and test what I'm saying to you today. Because what I'm saying to you today, I believe, is prophecy. Not prophecy that God has given me and like Aaron a prophet, no. Prophecy that's written down that I believe is to be exposed today for the future of the church. And so if you agree with me, it has a great deal of exciting and applicable things to your lives. If you don't, that's fine. But you need to weigh and test this yourself. You cannot just listen to me and agree or disagree without having gone to the scriptures and weighed and tested it. The last thing I want to say before we pray... The number seven in the Bible 
always has the connotation of completion. Always has the connotation of something being complete. It's, the number seven means completion or completedness in God. We have Genesis 1, ge the seven days of creation, or six days of creation and one day of rest, seven in total. Paul, in the New Testament, wrote to seven churches. Jesus, when giving the kingdom parables, trying to explain the kingdom in parables, he gave seven parables. And it's no coincidence that Jesus here speaks to seven churches. As one commentator puts it, he put this, the churches of all time are comprehended in the seven. The churches of all time are comprehended in the seven. This is a sermon that you either get really right or really wrong. And I'm really praying that I'm getting it really right. <laughs> So join me now in prayer, and then we will start off our sermon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your grace, for your mercy, for your help today to understand these things, Lord. Lord, it was you who said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I believe, Lord, there is a mystical element to that, Lord, of understanding the secondary reason, the prophetic reason behind why you chose these seven churches. And I pray, my Lord, now that you would expose it from the scriptures, that you would draw it out from the scriptures through me, Lord, to my brothers and sisters. I pray, Heavenly Father, not one would be lost along the way, Lord, that each one would be attentive to the word being spoken, that the information would not be overwhelming, Lord, but that it would be exciting and applicable to our lives. Lord, I thank you for this sermon. I pray, Heavenly Father, for your help, for your power, for your grace in preaching it. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now today we're going to be going through, in, a, in, a, in hopefully an hour, we're going to be going through the entirety of church history and future tense as well. Now when I say church history, for many people when they hear the word history, it's like, right, okay, wake me up when the sermon's over. But if I was to say to you, and I really want you to listen to this, because I, this is, I, hopefully this is going to say something to you, if I was to say to you individually, Let's sit down together and let's spend an hour going through your personal family history for 2,000 years before you. I guarantee every single person in this room would be like, that sounds fascinating. I want to know who my ancestors were 2,000 years ago. I want to know my family history because it's all about me. Yeah, I'd, I'd happily sit there for an hour, hour and, and have you take me through my family history. But I'd like to remind you of something. When you came into Christianity, when you came into the kingdom of God, you were born into a family, God's family. When I take you through church history, I'm taking you through your family's history. This is just as applicable to you as it is to every single Christian alive. This is your family's history we're about to learn. What your brothers and sisters went through and what your brothers and sisters will go through, and what we're going through now. So let us be just as attentive as if I was saying to you your own personal bloodline as well. This is our spiritual line, our spiritual family. So we're going to start with the church in Ephesus. We're going to be skimming through the churches, and there is going to be a lot of information today. I can't particularly apologise for it because it's needed. But I'm going to go through the different church ages that the churches represent. The dates are, are, are quite lax. You don't have to pay too much attention to the dates. Many of them overlap. I can't specifically tell you it happened here and it happened here. But what many, many Christians agree on is what they represented. So let's start with Ephesus. Jesus says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. To put it very simply to you, Ephesus represents the post-apostolic age of the church. Listen to what Paul said to Ephesus. It's, by the way, it's no coincidence that Ephesus is the first church. Listen to what the apostle Paul said to them in Acts 20. He said, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. 
The Apostle Paul said to Ephesus, once I leave, people are going to attack you from the outside and people are going to attack you from inside and I have no doubt that when I leave, the the ravenous wolves are going to start doing their work. You see, the apostles for the church represented really an, an authority for the worldwide church at that time. John calls the church his little children. Paul talks about being a father to the churches. The apostles were the final authority. The apostles were the ones whom scripture was breathed through. These were the men who had seen Jesus Christ firsthand, walked with him for three years. And these men traveled to and fro, building up the churches, correcting the churches, writing letters to the churches. They were like, as Paul puts it, the carers. The babysitters, to put it in a slightly more patronising way. But Paul uses this language. He says, I'm here as an in-between to kind of raise you up. But what happens when the apostles go? What happens when John, the last one, dies? The church is left to stand on its own two legs. And it now has to learn to walk with everything the apostles have invested into them. Jesus teaches that the apostles laid the foundation... And Paul says, after the foundation is laid, let every man be careful how he now builds upon it. Ephesus represents the post-apostolic age because in the first and second century, the biggest issue that the church faced was internal doctrinal issues. Look at what Jesus says about the church in Ephesus. I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. And listen to this next bit how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. The early church age, the post-apostolic age of the church, was defined by a zealous need for biblical truth. Remember, they, they weren't reading from a book like this. They had the apostle Paul at the pulpit <laughs> preaching Thessalonians. They had the Apostle Paul writing letters of Corinth to the churches. These guys weren't reading from the book. They had the apostles in front of them, breathing out living scripture in their very presence. These guys were passionate about the word of God. And they knew the word of God very, very well. Some of the best discipling that would ever have taken place in church history would have taken place in the first and second century. Imagine being discipled by the Apostle Peter, by the Apostle Paul, by the Apostle John. I couldn't choose anyone, apart from Jesus Christ himself, I couldn't choose anyone to be better discipled by. So Corinth, uh, sorry, Ephesus was a church, the Ephesus age of the church was an age where being doctrinally correct and keeping an eye out for internal deception was absolutely key. We see this in the letters that were written. A letter was written to Corinth warning them about divisions from within, moving in power but lacking in moral strength. The second letter to Corinth, Paul spends a vast majority defending his apostolic ministry. In the letter to 2 Corinthians, Paul calls out these fake super apostles. In Galatians, he says, who has bewitched you? Because the law had come in and there was an internal split between law and grace. In Ephesians, there's a manual on spiritual warfare. On Colossians, it was being reminding them on who Christ actually is. And in Thessalonians, it was correcting some eschatological understandings, some end times understandings that the church had. You see, all the letters that the apostles wrote to the churches were for one purpose and one purpose only. To safeguard the church from wrong understandings from theological debuts and false doctrines coming in. It was all centred around that same purpose. However, the early church, the post-apostolic age, had one thing they did wrong. What does Jesus say? I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Do you want to know what's fascinating about this? So many of the early churches never made it out of the second century. Many of the early churches never made it out of the second century. Thyatira was gone. 
by the end of the second century. Many of the early churches didn't make it out. And what was the reason? Jesus says, you have the doctrine, you have the theology, you know the Bible very well, you were face to face with the apostles, but this has happened. You have exchanged knowledge and understanding for love. You see, what happens to a church, when a church is being continually attacked from within and from outside, what can happen is we end up kind of closing ranks, fortifying our boundaries, and becoming seriously diligent and zealous around anything that looks like smoke in the church, because there might be fire. But what can very quickly happen when that happens is love goes out the window. It becomes legalistic. It becomes legalism hidden by the motive of staying biblically pure. And love is missing. The early church, the post-apostolic church, had all the Bible knowledge they needed, but they had forgotten the reason it all started. They had forgotten love for Jesus and love for each other. And Jesus says, if this doesn't stop, I'm going to come and take away the church altogether. Why does Jesus say such a stern warning? Because if the church isn't showing love, it can never show Christ. Jesus said, they'll know that you belong to me from how you love each other. If you don't love each other, your evangelism is worthless. It means nothing. They will know that you belong to me from how you love one another. And so Jesus says, if you're not going to love one another, if you're not going to love me, I'll just simply take the lampstand away. It's better me take it away than it remain in an unloving state. Then we move into the second church age, the Smyrna church, which is called the Age of Persecution. This is AD 150 to AD 312. The Smyrna age of the church was the church age of persecution under the Roman emperors. And I want to point out something that I think is very interesting. Jesus says to them, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Between AD 30 and AD 312, there were 54 emperors of the Roman Empire. Guess how many of them seriously persecuted the church? 10. 10 out of the 54 Roman emperors between AD 30 and AD 312 were most responsible for seriously persecuting the church and killing the most Christians. Jesus says to this age of the church, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. This church age is literally defined by persecution and by martyrdom. I just want to go through, and I'm going to try and keep this brief, because if I, if I go too far into it, we'll be here forever. A brief history of these 10 Roman emperors. AD 54 to AD 68, you had Nero. Most of us have heard of Nero. Nero was the emperor responsible for killing the apostle Peter and killing the apostle Paul. Nero also killed many other Christians. He fed Christians to lions, fed them into gladiatorial games, had them killed just simply because Nero, historically proven even by the Romans who wrote about him, literally was a megalomaniac. The guy was just off his rocker. He was crazy. I hope you don't mind my theological terms, but he was just absolutely bonkers. And even his own Roman citizens, even the own Roman historians, wrote about Nero in that manner, that he was a bit of a psychopath. What, what disturbs me a great deal is for some strange reason at Hampton Court, if you've been to Hampton Court and you're walking over the bridge into the castle, I don't know why this is, I'm interested about this, but there's two photos, not photos, sorry, there's two portraits of two Roman emperors on the entrance to Hampton Court. One is Nero and the other is Tiberius, two of the worst emperors when it came to Christianity. It's a strange thing that's on our castles in England. The next one in 81 AD and 96 AD was Domitian. He was the one alive when John wrote Revelation. He was the one to first proclaim himself as God. Domitian was the first Roman emperor who said, you are to address me as Lord, you are to address me as God, and once a year on the Lord's day, you are to bow down and worship me, burn a bit of incense. If you don't, you could be imprisoned or killed. We have Marcus Aurelius in AD 161 to 180. 
He saw Christianity as a dangerous revolutionary force preaching gross immoralities. <laughs> I don't know what preaching he was listening to, but Christianity was a dangerous revolutionary force that threatened the polytheistic way the Romans worshipped. Polytheistic or polytheism is literally the worship of multiple gods. He said Christianity threatens our way of life because they're monotheistic, they believe in one God. In AD 193 to 211, you have Septimus Severus. He demanded that there would be no more conversions to Christianity. He made it illegal in the Roman Emperor to convert to Christianity. If you did, you could be put to death. There was Decius in 249 to 251, Valerian 253 to 260, and the last two, the last two of this age are by far the worst. Dilatian, the emperor in 284 AD to 305 AD, was the first emperor who started an empire-wide persecution of Christians. His goal, as written down, was the absolute extermination of anyone who followed the way. And I say the way because we know it as Christianity, but back then it was called the way. Basically, anyone who followed Jesus Christ. He started a wide, a, an empire-wide persecution of the saints. He wanted them destroyed. His successor, the last emperor of this persecution age, was a man named Galerius. And Galerius used to roll Christians up in flammable substances, hang them on his garden as torches, light them on fire, and ride his horses up and down the garden celebrating. That was one of his favourite pastimes. Christians would be burning alive as torches in his garden as he rode around screaming and yelling. He was the last emperor of this persecution age. Something very strange happened to Galerian. On his deathbed, he announced an edict for more liberality towards Christians, that they should be treated better. I don't know what happened. I don't know whether the gospel pierced his heart. I have no idea, but it literally switched on his deathbed. He brought out an edict, said we need to be treating them better. I don't know why, but he did. What does Jesus say about Smyrna? I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Smyrna is the only church out of the seven where Jesus affirms them as being rich. The only one. The others have richness mentioned, but they're not really rich. So I would like to put it to you. If the Ephesus age of the church was the best discipled, the Smyrna age of the church is by far the richest the church has ever been. A church that, to be a Christian, you are under constant threat of life, politically, economically, socially, physically. What it meant was, as a Christian during the Smyrna age of the church, if you were at church, if you were gathering as a Christian, every single person in that room was willing to follow Jesus Christ to death. Because it was an actual risk. I want you to imagine for a minute, just put yourself in their shoes. Let's say we gather here on a Sunday. But let's say that you coming here on a Sunday literally means that as you walk out this door, you could be taken. That risk is there every single Sunday. You could be taken or you could be killed. Imagine that's there. Now ask yourself, how many of us would come to church? How many of us would walk through the door? It's a, different, it's a whole different experience. It's a whole different world. But what did Jesus say? Of all the churches, you're rich. You're rich. There would have been nothing but genuine. You are rich. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. During this church age, there were more Christians persecuted than all the other church ages we're about to have a look at. More Christians martyred during this 300 years than most of church history. 
And so what does Jesus say to them? Listen to me. The one who conquers to the end will not be hurt by the second death. The one who is faithful unto death will be given the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This was the age of martyrs. But as we're about to see, that is all about to change. From 312 AD, the church was about to enter into a very, very, very different season. A season that has massively impacted and defined the church to this day, and not in a good way. On that cliffhanger, we're going to stop. We've got about two minutes. I think we'll carry on for one minute, and then we'll stop and get ready for the silence. I'm just aware if I start the next bit. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite a big church age. The next one is 313 AD to 590 AD. And the way I'd like you to understand this title is the marriage between state and church. This is when the church entered into a marriage from the world to the church, the church to the world. And this is going to massively define everything we now see in Christianity today. So now we are in Pergamum. Pergamum represents the marriage of church and state. If you remember in Pergamum, what did Jesus say about them? He said, you hold fast my name and you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas. So what Jesus says about Pergamum is in the past, you have been faithful to me. In the past, you have held my name even in the days of my servant Antipas. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. If you remember the church of Pergamum, the church of Pergamum was where Balaam in Israel had convinced the Israelite men to come after Moabite women and because the Moabite women led them astray, they then worshipped the Moabite gods and they then ate food sacrificed to idols. Well, in 312 AD, another Balaam was born. And instead of leading away Israel, this man, I believe, led away the church. His name was Constantine. For 300 years, the church had faced nothing but persecution under Roman emperors. Death and destruction is all they had known under the Roman Empire until one man raised up and changed not just the face of the church, but changed the face of the world forever. We're going to have a little look at the rise of Constantine quickly. This is from information I gathered from a historian known as Eusebius, who was Constantine's court bishop, and Lucius Firminus, a court advisor to Constantine. This is from worldhistory.org if you want to have a look at it yourself. In the year 312 AD, Constantine was at a battle called the Battle of Milvanian Bridge. And the night before the battle, he prayed. And according to people close to him, in his prayer, as he went to sleep that night, he saw a cross in the sky. And the cross said, in this you will conquer. Constantine woke up and believed he had been spoken to by the Lord Jesus Christ. He recognised the cross was associated with Christians. Jesus has spoken to me. He went to sleep the second night and he woke up and the cross was there again, but with a slight hook on top. And once again, in this, you shall conquer. So the next day before his soldiers went into battle, and this is historically recorded, he had every single one of his soldiers in his battalion put the image of a cross on their shield. And they did win the Battle of Milvane. They won the battle there. Before this moment, Constantine was part of a Roman offshoot called Sol Invictus. Sol Invictus was a Roman cult that worshipped the sun god. An emperor named Elagabalus, these names, tell you what, this is tricky. Elagabalus, try that one out for size. An emperor named Elagabalus, I'm saying it three times, why do I keep saying it? <laughs> this, this emperor, before Constantine, had a crazy idea. He took all of the Roman gods, 
Jupiter included, and placed them all under this one banner of Sol Invictus, the sun god. When he did this, it angered the Roman officials so much, he was actually assassinated for it later on. How dare you take polytheism and make it monotheistic? How dare you take all the Roman gods and make them one? And they actually killed him for it. Well, Constantine belonged to this cult. He belonged to Sol Invictus, so did his father before him. They believed in the sun god, and the sun god had a motto. One god, one empire. That was the motto. One god, one empire. So we have to first ask ourselves the question, was his conversion to Christianity legit? Was it a real conversion? I have a few bits of evidences that may point us in the right direction. First of all, he continued worshipping the sun god alongside Jesus for 10 years after apparently being converted. Until, a, until about 10 years after his conversion, when apparently Constantine received a word from God only to worship Jesus. So he was converted for 10 years he worshipped the sun god and he worshipped Jesus and then about 10 years later he received this word of God that said no more sun god, just Jesus. And Constantine was like, okay, fine, just Jesus. Despite his apparent conversion, Constantine was not baptised straight away. In fact, he was baptised on his deathbed by a Christian who didn't believe that Jesus was God. And the reason he wasn't baptised straight away is what he said to his followers, I can't be baptised straight away because as emperor, I'm going to get a lot more blood on my hands before it's all finished. That's his own words. After his conversion, Constantine went on to kill his wife and went on to kill his only son on the grounds of sexual immorality. And despite legalising Christianity in the Edict of Milan, the Edict of Milan is when Constantine basically legalised Christianity and made it the state religion, despite legalising Christianity, he went on to officiate many pagan rituals and many pagan weddings as seen in historical documents under the Sol Invictus cult. In fact, many Catholic cathedrals, when they've dug deep down into the tombs, have actually found portraits of, of next to Christians' tombs of not Jesus, but Sol Invictus. A man with a fire around his head in a golden chariot with the word Sol Invictus under it. So was his conversion legit? I personally believe absolutely not. But once again, weigh and test. But Constantine did do some pretty important things that have pretty much shaped every single one of your Christian lives, whether you know it or not. Believe me, he has, mine included. Constantine was the man who brought about the first ever council of Nicene. A council that was brought about to debate whether Jesus was God or whether he was man. Whether he was truly God or whether he was a created being. In the council was when the Trinity was decided. It's when the first use of the word Trinity was made. And don't worry, you're thinking, oh my goodness, we've been invaded, don't worry. This was done by true Christians who were at the council who brought about a good understanding of who God is in counter to the ones who were saying Jesus was created and wasn't God. However, Easter was created at the Council of Nicene. Constantine himself is quoted as have saying this about Passover. Passover, by the way, is the Jewish festival where we now have Easter. It's actually Passover. Listen to what Constantine said about Passover. It is an unworthy thing that in the celebration of this most holy feast, we should follow the practices of the Jews who have impiously defiled their hands with enormous sin and are therefore deservedly afflicted with blindness of soul. Let us then have nothing in common with the detestable Jewish crowd. For we have received from our saviour a different way. Constantine said, the Lord has shown me Easter. Now I could get into Christmas, <coughs> but we're awfully close. <laughs> and I, I've got to admit, I do like the celebration. However, however, we could go down that route, and my goodness, if I finished it, I don't know how many of you will be having Christmas trees this year. Listen to what else Constantine said in the Council of Nicene. This really is the beginning of the end, really, for, for Constantine. Listen to what he says. Until Christ returns, 
The Christian emperor stands in for Christ. And so he carries the identical power of God on earth as he rules. It was after this council that Christian emperors began to be seen in depictions of them with halos above their heads. And it was after this council that Christian emperors were then called saints of God. It all happened in Nicene. What did this do to the church? The church went from persecution to privilege. The church went from threat of death, from threat of imprisonment, to luxury. Do you know that it became socially important to be a Christian? It became economically profitable to be a Christian. It became politically profitable to be a Christian. Do you know how many people had been worshipping Apollos for their entire lives politically and then all of a sudden, after Constantine converted, after the Edict of Milan, these Roman officials suddenly found Jesus? Now, I'm sure some of them did, but the vast majority of them jumped on the bandwagon of the direction that Constantine was taking them. Constantine was the first one to invest into the, into the clergy. He was the one who built the huge basilicas in Rome. He was the one who then who dressed the priests up in these long robes, gave them these big hats with these golden staffs. It was Constantine who poured, not thousands and thousands, because different, different currency, but poured money after money after money into the church, into the clergy, set up statues, set up these incredible cathedrals. Because in the Roman gods, one of the ways that you showed your appreciation of them as gods is the bigger the building, the bigger the temple, the better the statues, the more you love them. So what did Constantine do? Well, I love Jesus, so I'm going to build the biggest, best buildings with the biggest, best robes and the biggest, silliest looking hats I possibly can. <laughs> and that will show you how much I love Jesus. The church went from meeting in houses to meeting in cathedrals. It went from praying in small groups to gatherings of thousands. It went from depending on God every day to being lavish with all sorts of riches. The church went from being a light in the darkness, being separate, being holy, being different, countercultural, counter worldview, offensive in the gospel it preaches, to being comfortable, privileged, safe guarded, successful, and when you looked at the Roman Emperor, and you looked at the Roman Empire, and you looked at the church, you could no longer see the difference. Fully invaded, fully transformed, fully married. Two become one, and the church became one with state. What does Jesus say to these guys? I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. The Roman Catholic Church, has, when you mention sexual immorality, religiously wise, one of the first religions that come to your mind is the Roman Catholic Church rife to the core with sexual immorality, rife to the core with idolatry, and this was something the church was brought into. One pope is recorded as to having the skull of the Apostle Thomas being brought in to the Basilica, Peter's Basilica in Rome, and he had himself and the entire congregation bow down before the skull of the Apostle Thomas and pray to the skull, and he thanked the skull for coming out of the grave to bless the church. What does that sound like? That's talking to the dead. That's mediums. That's worship of death. That's witchcraft. That's evil. That's idolatry. And that was one of the popes doing that, leading the church into it. Jesus says, therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. Do you know what the sword does? It separates. God's word separates. Constantine brought peace to the church. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. Constantine brought peace to the church. Jesus says, do not think that I've come to bring peace. 
I have not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Jesus came to divide between those in the kingdom and those who are not. Constantine united. And unfortunately, the gross mixture of these two created a church that, as we're about to see, became hopeless in reaching people. Now, before we go to the last four churches, I want to mention something that's very important. The first three churches we've just covered do not mention Jesus coming back. Okay, this is really, this is where the prophecy now comes in for us. The first three churches have no mention of Jesus' return. The last four churches all mention the return of Jesus. I would like to suggest to you that all four of the last churches in some way, shape or form will be here when Jesus returns. Will enter into the tribulation apart from one. The last four churches will all enter into the tribulation period, apart from one. So not all four, three out of the four. Let's go to the next church age, the church of Thyatira. This is the longest church age, 590 AD to 1517. And the title for Thyatira is the reign of the popes. The reign of the popes. Let's have a listen to what he says. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So Jesus tells us here the church had indeed grown. Because whether the Roman Catholic Church did it for the wrong motives or not, they did indeed, whether by accident or whether on purpose, spread the gospel. The gospel did indeed go out to the entire world. Unfortunately, much of it was by force. But the gospel did go out and the church did grow. The Roman Catholic Empire or Roman Catholic Church spread globally. Many, many people came to Christ. And so in that sense, the latter works do exceed the first. Now, one of the arguments you'll have from uh, Roman Catholic priests who would like to say this is that we can trace the popes all the way back to St. Peter. They'll tell you that you can trace the popes all the way back to St. Peter. We have the correct lineage. The first person to ever be given the name Pope was in 366 AD, Damascus I. He was the first person to have ever been given the name Pope. Any of the Christians before him would have had no idea what you're talking about. Peter would have turned around and said, who's Pope? Pope what? 366 AD was when the first Pope was finally officially called Pope. All the Christians before it that they say were Popes had no idea about the titles they've now been given in the future. (laughs) So it doesn't really make too much sense, does it? I know your works, your love and faithful service and your patient endurance that your latter works exceed the first, but listen to this next bit. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. By the end of the fourth century, the beginning of prayers of veneration through Mary had begun. Now, we often make a mistake as Christians. We accuse the Roman Catholics of praying to Mary. That's actually technically not correct. What they do is something called prayers of veneration. They pray to God through Mary. That's the difference. Thank you, Mary, for making the way for me to pray to God. So prayers of veneration are praying to God through Mary. By the end of the 5th century, there was full-blown worship and prayer as Mary, the mother of God, began to climb in her importance in the Roman Catholic Church. But Pope Gregory in 590 AD was really the one who turned the heat up. He basically came out and said, from now on, every single Christian is to believe this, that Mary was completely and absolutely sinless. That she had never sinned, that she was perfect from birth, just as Christ, and that's the only reason that she was able to bring Jesus into the world. I I don't really need to try and disprove this. It's a clear contradiction of everything Scripture says 
All have sinned, all have fallen short, none have done good, none are worthy, except the Lamb of God who has no blemishes, spots or wrinkles. So I, I, sometimes I actually feel a bit like deflated having to even debate that. There's much harder things in scripture we can have a debate about than that. However, it's believed to this day. So who is Jezebel? Now, I want to make something very clear. Mary, the true mother of Jesus, will not be offended by what I'm saying because when I meet her, when I see her, she will know that I wasn't talking about her. I am not talking about the humble Mary who was chosen by God to bring forth the Saviour into the world, who spent her entire life, by the way, pointing people to Jesus, not to herself. She won't be offended by what I've got to say because she knows I'm not referring to her. I'm referring to what we talked about. I'm referring to those Babylonian goddesses. I'm referring to what Mary became, the idea of Mary. She calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual morality. Listen, the church under the Roman Catholic, when it first began, what did Jesus say? You're teaching them to practice sexual morality. You're teaching them to worship idols. Now the reign of the popes, you're teaching them to practice sexual morality. You're teaching them to worship idols. The sin hasn't changed. Two church ages, the sin hasn't changed. It's the same issue. You're bowing down to statues. You're bowing down to paintings. You're praying to saints. You're praying to a woman who can't hear you. And you're practicing sexual morality as well. It's synonymous with the Roman Catholic clergy. And unfortunately, I've got to be honest, unfortunately, because of the reputation, sexual morality is often synonymous with Christians. When you look across the world today, pastors, it seems to be every week, are being exposed for some form of adult adultery, some form of fornication. It seems to be every week a new story comes out from the US or from England or from somewhere in the world that a pastor has let down the clergy through committing sexual morality or sexual morality. And you've got to ask yourself, the pastor's being called out publicly because he's in a public light. But if he's committing sexual morality, what do you think the congregation are doing? If they're being led by a man like that, what do you think they're up to? Unfortunately, Christianity has become synonymous with these things. And it started here. Not only did this happen, but a paper written in 2006 by a man named David Plasted did an extensive study. And it is quite extensive. I flicked through it. It's like hundreds of pages. I, I, was, I tried to read it, but oh my goodness. And he worked out how many people were killed by the Roman Catholic Church from the moment it was born to the moment that the Reformation happened and after the Reformation to this day. And he worked out that over 100 million people have been murdered and killed for standing against the Roman Catholic understandings, dogma and doctrines. Over 100 million people. Jesus says, you've got blood on your hands. Only hold fast what you have until I come. Now, now this I love, by the way, and this is, I know I've really you know, kind of battered the Roman Catholic for a, a little while, but I want to give you some hope here. Listen to what Jesus says. Hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will go give authority over the nations. Do you know what Jesus said to them? He said, there are some among you who still love me. There are still those among you who know me. There are still those among you who follow me. There are still those among you who are saved, even during it. And as much as I've brought up a lot of negative stories, there are some beautiful stories about Catholic priests who bring the Gospels to places that no one would dare go. Catholic priests who were martyred for the faith. Catholic priests who preached Jesus wherever they went, wanted people to believe in the Gospel, wanted people to give their lives to the Lord. There's always true Christians in amidst these things. During COVID, a group of Roman Catholic priests in England got together and wrote a letter completely and absolutely denouncing the authority of the Pope, saying that they will no longer engage in Mary worship and they no longer submit in any way, shape or form to the Pope that they submit to God and God alone, but they will remain in their clergies because they love the people. 
fair play to them. They're brothers and sisters in Christ, just as we are. Hold fast what you have until I come. Jesus says, you need to hold on to it because you are currently in a system that's going to do everything to take it away. Hold on to what you have. Let's move to Sardis. Now, if you think I've had a little bit of a pop at the Roman Catholics, I'm going to have a bit of a go now at the Protestants as well. I'm a very popular guy after this sermon. Let's have a look at the church in Sardis. We're going to leave the Roman Catholics alone now. Let's have a look at what happens in Sardis. Sardis is the church age of 1517 to 1730. And this is the famous moment in 1517 where a German priest named Martin Luther hung his 95 thesis on the wall of Wittenberg Castle as a complete and absolute declaration that he was moving out of the Roman Catholic Church, addressing many of the things that they were doing. The reasons that Martin Luther wrote the thesis were several. The main reason is to to counter something called indulgences. Indulgences in the Roman Catholic Church had become an everyday thing. What it would be is, David, do you want to be forgiven of something? Bring me a hundred quid tomorrow, and I'll put my hand on you, and you'll be forgiven. Sheila, do you want to bring me some gold? I'll put my hand on you. Ben, come on, bring me a horse. I'll put my hand on you, and I'll forgive you. Bring me a PlayStation 5, anyone. I actually will. No, I'm joking. But the, but the indulgences were coming to the Roman Catholic clergy, and the most basic of priests to the Pope himself would receive gifts from the congregation, and based on the gifts they would receive, they would atone sin. One of the most blasphemous things they used to do is they would receive gifts for the dead so that they could be atoned in purgatory. The Pope would receive indulgences, priests would receive indulgences so that they could pray for the dead relatives of people in purgatory and they could then be saved and lifted up. Martin Luther literally writes it, and I did actually read the 95 Thesis, it's fascinating. Martin Luther (laughs) writes a thesis completely and absolutely debunking and rebuking every aspect of it. Here's two things he writes. One of his things in the thesis. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God. Praise God for that. Thus, those indulgent preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. This is things that Martin Luther wrote. Martin Luther was not the only reformer. There was Martin Luther, John Calvin, his teaching stressed the importance of God's predestination. There was a man named Eurich from Sweden. He taught that the Bible should be the basis of our moral compass. And William Tyndall, a famous man in England who believed that commoners should be able to read the Bible. Roman Catholics up to this point had only ever preached the Bible in Latin. You would have loved the services, come out there not understanding a thing anyone said. They only preached it in Latin. William Tyndall said, no, the commoner needs to be able to read the Bible. The rich need to be able to read the Bible. Everyone needs to be able to read the Bible. These were four great men of the Reformation. It challenged the authority of the Pope, the scriptures being the focal point of life, the scriptures not being read in Latin, the abuse of power within the church, the indulgences used for the atonement of sin, confessional practices and the remission of sin by God alone, the gospel message being at the centre of the church, and a works-based salvation that the Roman Catholic Church preached. The Reformation was to tackle all of these things. Now, all of this to say, why is it Sardis? Look what God says to Sardis. The words of him who has the seven spirits and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your work complete in the sight of my God. Everything I've just said about the Protestant Reformation, and I 100% believe they're Sardis. And here's why. Martin Luther was a great man of God, and God used him to do many good things. Here's a few things about him, however, that might shock you. Martin Luther believed still in purgatory. Preached it, believed in it, 100%. Martin Luther believed that if you were good in purgatory, you could work your way up. 
If you were bad in purgatory, you worked your way down. He still believed that. Martin Luther believed that communion was literally the body and blood of Christ. He literally believed that when you take communion, you are eating the body, literally, drinking the blood, literally. He believed in the Eucharist being the literal body of Christ. The Reformation did not create a spirit-led revival. It was needed, it was necessary, but my goodness, it was messy and also destructive. Now, I want to make something very clear. The Reformation needed to happen. It was God-led, God-inspired. But look at what Jesus says. I have not found your works complete. One commentator put it like this. The Reformation started something, but they didn't finish it. They started something, but they didn't finish it. What came out of the Reformation is civil war amongst the church. Hundreds of denominations, hundreds of different offshoots of theology, hundreds of different offshoots of doctrines came out of it. There was literally a civil war in Germany because the peasants looked at the teachings of Martin Luther, rose up and went to war. A hundred thousand of them died. And then Martin Luther at the end condemned the war and brought it to a finish. It brought about the Inquisition where 10 million men and women labelled as heretics were killed by the Roman Catholic Church. By the way, I would have been one of them. You were killed if you didn't believe in infant baptism. If you believed in baptising someone who had already been baptised as an infant, you're dead. And you know who would have been one of the people condemning me to death? Not the Roman Catholic Church. The reformers. They also took these beliefs with them. And the reformers were responsible for condemning quite a few people who stood for what I consider now truth. I've baptised about a dozen people who were baptised as babies. I'd be well and truly dead. And that was under men who reformed the church from the Roman Catholic Church. Reformations took place all over the globe for every reason but a godly one. In our country, Henry VIII created his own reformation when he was just simply not allowed to divorce his wife. He created the Church of England in order that he could do something that at, at its basis was unbiblical. The foundation of the Church, in, or Church of England is built on a man's desire to commit sexual immorality. Jesus says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. I have a way of putting it. Many people did. There was a max exodus out of the Roman Catholic Church. Many people did walk out of the Roman Catholic Church. But if I can put it to you like this, they sleepwalked out. They sleepwalked out of one into another. Martin Luther has something called the pastoral diaries. He traveled up and down, going to different churches under the Protestant Reformation to see what the state of the church was. This was years after the Reformation. Going up and down, something called the pastoral diaries. You can look it up for yourself. And in the pastoral diaries, he writes to the archbishop and he says to him, the condition of Christianity is dire. When the preacher starts to preach, the congregation leave. They are blind, they do not understand what they're being taught, there is no worship in the church. Christianity, if not changed, is going to fall off the face of the earth forever. Those are literally what he said. He literally said, if it does not change, Christianity is gone. That's from Martin Luther himself. So what does Jesus say? Wake up! It's good that you've separated. It's good that you've separated yourself. But unfortunately, they separated themselves from one marriage straight into another. England went from being married to the Roman Catholic Church to Henry VIII then marrying the church to the Church of England and the State of England. Just went from one marriage to another. But look at what Jesus says. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Jesus says there are still, once again, there are still those among you who love me and who are doing what is right. So like I say, and I want to make this clear, the Reformation was needed. It was important, a very important point. The reason we can be here today is because the work that God did in that Reformation. However, 
It was a work that started and was by no means complete. The amount of division amongst churches around doctrinal issues, around theological understandings, and must I say as well, around the gospel was rampant. Was rampant. Even the reformers themselves had only half of what they needed. They understood lots, but they didn't understand a great deal more. And that's not me, by the way, trying to elevate us above them. They had spent over a thousand years in an indoctrinated religious system. I'm pretty sure every single one of us would come out the same. The fact that they could come out knowing what they knew is a miracle in itself after spending that many years in that system. Then we come to Philadelphia, the last two churches. Philadelphia is 1730 till now. Philadelphia started, the church age of Philadelphia started with what some of you may recognise as called the Great Awakening. In 1730, it was the first great awakening. It gave way to men such as Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, Charles Wesley, John Whitfield, C.S. Lewis. These men came up and there suddenly was a spirit and a passion for the gospel, a passion for evangelism. It seems that the understanding had been completed and now the church was sent out. This is the age of the missionaries, the age of church planting, the age of sharing the gospel to the lost. And look what Jesus says. The words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. This is so encouraging. Why? Guess what? The door's still open. This is so encouraging. I opened the door in 1730. It hasn't been shut yet. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. As long as the Philadelphian church is on this planet, that door will never be shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. This is so true, isn't it? Have but little power. We look at the apostolic church. Paul gave you his napkin, his handkerchief, sorry, And the handkerchief, well, not the handkerchief, but by touching the handkerchief, demons were cast out. If I give you my handkerchief, you're just going to get a cold. That's that's the the only thing that's going to happen. And I'm not saying demons can't be cast out. I'm just saying my handkerchief's going to be pretty useless compared to Paul's. But do you know what we have? We understand the gospel in a way that is completely, well, completely as it's meant to be. There is an understanding of scripture now that hasn't been around since the post-apostolic age. There are insights into the word of God being revealed to men and women of God that haven't been here since the apostles walked the earth. We have little power, but we have the gospel. And it has become the centre of the Philadelphian church. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. In 1730, in New England, in America alone, 150 churches were planted. Over 50,000 people gave their life to Christ in that one state. That was mirrored across the globe. John Wesley was preaching in Cornwall, praying for the sick, and people were just having a beach day out, and he had thousands of people around him. In St. Ives, I've been to the place where he preached, where thousands of people gathered on the beach to hear him preach the gospel. And here as well, in Leatherhead as well. Yeah, in Leatherhead as well. Wow. Last sermon in Leatherhead. That's amazing. See how good God is, an open door for evangelism. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet and they will learn that I have loved you. How did the world learn that God loved the church? Because a revival spread. It was evidence that God loved the church because hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of churches were suddenly appearing out of nowhere. Chuck Smith in the 1960s, the founder of Calvary Chapel, just started preaching to some hippies. 
and now thousands of Calvary Chapel churches are across the globe. The Philadelphian church is still here now. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, now listen to this next bit, this is where it gets a bit controversial. I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole earth to try those who dwell on the earth. The Roman Catholic Church will enter into tribulation. The dead Protestant church will enter into tribulation. Laodicea will enter into tribulation. But it seems to be here that Jesus says to the Philadelphian church, I'm going to take you out. I will keep you from the hour of trouble that is going to fall upon the whole earth. (coughs) The Philadelphian church, the true evangelical gospel-centered, spirit-filled, Jesus-loving church. And I'm not talking about DC. I'm talking about individuals. We are the church. And what does Jesus say? I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Now, when he says I'm coming soon, some people say he's talking about the second coming. I don't think he's talking about the second coming. Because he's just told them, I'll keep you from the hour of trouble. Then directly afterwards, he says, I'm coming soon. What does the Bible say? You'll meet him in the clouds. Jesus says, I'm coming to get you soon. Hold on to what you have. I'm nearly there. Hold on. I'm nearly there. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven and my own new name. Notice how many times God is mentioned. God is in the center of everything that is going on here. Notice how kingdom is mentioned. The new Jerusalem, the crowns upon the head. This is the destiny of those who are truly spirit-filled, Jesus-following Christians. I am coming soon. And then we have the last one, Laodicea. Laodicea, unfortunately, once again, I believe, will enter into the tribulation. Laodicea, as described, is the church that thought they were rich, prospered, needed nothing, when actually they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind and naked. Laodicea is still also currently here. In fact, Laodicea is growing. In fact, may I put it another way? Philadelphia is shrinking. Now, I don't mean the open door has been closed. The gospel is still going to go out, trust me, until the day we go. But Philadelphia is shrinking. Laodicea is growing and the line in which which one you are in is becoming more and more visible. Laodicea is liberal Christianity. Laodicea is the mega churches with the multi-million pound private jets. Laodicea is the one who seem to have a thousand people convert to Christ every single week, who talk about tithes every single Sunday. And before they ever preach a message for 10 minutes, they spend 45 talking about your wallets and your purses. Laodicea have the beautiful buildings, the beautiful services, the amazing worship, the hands held high. Laodicea look rich, profitable, prospered. They look everything like what a Christian's meant to be. Laodicea is where the majority of Christianity is right now. Laodicea says God is a God of love. And therefore, he accepts all things and all people. Laodicea says, the LGBT community can absolutely, a man can marry a man, a woman can marry a woman. A boy can be a girl and a girl can be a boy. And not only that, they can be pastors and priests while they're at it as well. Laodicea are the ones who turn blind eyes to sin, to adultery, to violence, to fraud. Laodicea is the apostate church, the apostate church, sorry. Laodicea is the church full of people pretending to be Christians. They look like it, they sound like it, they smell like it. I don't know what a Christian smells like, but... (laughs) A sweet aroma, very good. You know your Bible. 
But Laodicea, Jesus says this, I'm outside, knocking. Let me in. I'm outside, knocking. Laodicea will be here. Per- Thyatira will be here. Sardis will be here. And the line is becoming clearer and clearer in this world as to which one you are in. Now let me, now let me put across a warning. Just because you're sitting in Disciples Church does not mean you are in Philadelphia. And I, ha- I need to say this to you. I don't want to say this to you. I need to say this to you. Just because you are sitting in Disciples Church does not mean you are in Philadelphia. Because what does Jesus say at the end of his letters? Let everyone who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Individually first, Jesus talks to us. It's individually that we are either in Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, or Thyatira. I hope, I believe that we are Philadelphia. But that hope is in Christ and Christ alone, not in my own works or my own righteousness or our ability to be a really good church. Because remember about Laodicea? They looked rich. They looked profitable. They looked like they understood all things. And look what Jesus says to them. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. There is a beautiful bit of scripture in Revelation that says something. It says that there are a multitude of people without number dressed in white with palm branches in their hands. And it says this. John said to the angel, who are these multitude without number? And the angel says to John, these are those saved in the tribulation. I believe some people accept the warning of Christ in Laodicea. During the tribulation, it seems to be that there are many who open the door to Christ. Praise God for that. He does not leave Laodicea by saying, you're apostate, you're disgusting, you're gone, you make me sick, see you later. He leaves Laodicea by saying, listen to me, I love you, I'm knocking, I want to save you, open the door, be rescued by me. And according to Revelation, from what we can see, many, many do. So that is a sermon on the last 2,000 years of church history and however many more years we have to go. Now, for the rest of Revelation, by now it's fairly obvious that I do hold a pre-tribulation rapture view. It's pretty obvious, right? If I didn't, then I'm lying. I I believe in a pre-trib rapture. I do want to make something very, very clear. Two things going forward. One, the book of Revelation for me will not be defined by a pre-tribulation rapture. I'm not going to preach Revelation solely focusing on the fact that we're not there. And it's linked to my second reason. I might be wrong. The rapture is the only event in the Bible that Jesus says, not angels, not man, no one knows. I do not want to create Christians who go, "Ah." (laughs) see you later world. In in all seriousness, there's a terrible story in China. The Chinese church was underground and American missionaries came to China to preach the gospel. And these American missionaries preached a pre-tribulation rapture gospel to them continually, pre-trib, pre-trib, pre-trib. Years and years and years later, one of these Chinese Christians came to America and they came to one of the churches. And this is a true story of one of the pastors who had preached this to them. And he walked straight up to the front after the service and said, why did you lie to me? The pastor said, what do you mean? Chinese Christians said, My mother was killed, my father was killed, my son was killed, my friends were killed, my community was nearly destroyed, and I barely escaped with my life. You told me Jesus was going to rescue me from tribulation, but all I've had my whole entire life is tribulation. Why did you lie to me? When you make pre-trib rapture the defining doctrine of your faith, 
and the defining thing of revelation, you are in dangerous territory. So let me make it clear to you guys. Just because I believe in a pre true rapture does not mean that I don't believe we can be martyred. Or that I don't believe that I can be imprisoned. Or I don't believe I could lose my family. Or I don't believe that we could come under some of the worst persecution this country's ever faced. I believe we're going to be rescued from a seven-year period called the tribulation. But Jesus says every Christian will have tribulation. Don't let it become this defining thing that weakens your faith. Let it, let it give you hope. Let it give you strength. But please don't think it's a get-out-of-jail-free card. The get-out-of-jail-free card is Jesus Christ on the cross, not a pre-trib rapture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Lord, I, ha I humbly have to accept that if I'm right about the prophetic element of the seven churches, it is all glory to you and by the power of the Holy Spirit you have revealed it to us. Lord, if I'm wrong, then I will have to repent before you and stand before you and hold account as to what I've taught at this pulpit today in front of my brothers and sisters. As you say, Lord, that those who teach the word of God have a higher judgment. So, Father, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that if this word is from you, if this word is from your Holy Spirit, that it would do what the Bible says it will do. It will go out and not return to you until it has finished the work it was set out to do. I pray, Lord God, you would be sovereign over my brothers' and sisters' minds and hearts and you would speak into their minds and hearts the things that we've learned today. And as we make our way through the book of Re Revelation, Lord, I ask, Heavenly Father, we would have a balanced view, a balanced understanding that we would be both hopeful for the future, but also prepared for what it may bring. Help us to have wisdom and discernment going forward, Lord, I ask in your precious name. Amen.